minds for holy words. We ask all of the things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You would be Heather. Needy. God bless you guys. Daniel. Riley. Kia. Tanner. Alejandro. Thank you. Jesus. Crystal. Friends, these are now family members here at Granite Bay. I make a, I make a vote, a motion, that we accept them here as our members, and in that motion, I would ask you to be their family. Seeing these children here at church, these young people, that you may stand by their side, comfort them, guide them, lead them in whatever they, they're needing at the moment. Is that acceptable? Amen. Amen. God bless you, and God bless you and your families. Amen. What a blessing to, to see the uh, lives being transformed and the power of the word and uh, these commitments being made. Uh, and the beautiful music. I want to thank our choir and our orchestra and the leaders for all the work that they've done in, uh, in preparing the music for our worship service. Following the message this morning, don't run out the door, we've got uh, something special that they'll be sharing. We are continuing our series now called Cover to Cover, Jesus in All of the Bible. And today I feel like I should be kicking off my shoes because this is holy ground in that we're going to be talking about David as a type of Christ in the Bible. There are so many examples in the scripture where you see the relationship between David in the Old Testament and Jesus. Jesus, of course, is called the Son of David. And it might be appropriate for me to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 12, verse 35. We'll begin with that. Mark chapter 12, verse 35. And Jesus is teaching and interacting with the, the religious leaders. And we'll read through verse 37. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, talking about one of the Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? How could you have a son that's your Lord? Of course, that would be a question Mary could ask too. How can you have a son that is also your creator? So Jesus is saying, you're calling the Messiah the son of David, but he is yet, the son of David is the Lord of David also. And this was a, a very powerful statement. The Bible tells us, and the common people heard him gladly. You know, David is one of the most fascinating characters in the Bible because people have different personality types. You've probably heard, you know, some people are sanguine. Karen has a little bit of that in her. She's always the last one to leave the church because she's visiting with everybody and, and uh, just a very cheerful. And, and uh, then you've got your people that are more caloric and they're task-oriented and they're, they're the, the focus people and then you got your melancholy creative people and they kind of cut their ups and their downs and then you got your phlegmatic people hand grenades are going off and they just don't care nothing bothers them and you know what I mean you get these different personality types David seems to be a little bit of everything I've never met such a complex character that is a paradox you know in one verse you see a picture of David he's the warrior going out to kill and the next verse you've got him strumming a harp and then you got him you know chopping off Goliath's head uh, but then you've got him being an administrator and an architect and a builder and 
he, he's just such a uh, complex character. It's like he's got all four corners of the compass in this one individual. And I look forward to talking to David in the kingdom. David is one of the most important, probably the second most important person in the Bible, if you just go by how often he's referenced. The name of David is mentioned in the Bible even more than the name of our Lord Jesus. You'll find his name 1,066 times in Scripture. A great deal of the books of First and Second Samuels and even part of First Kings talk about David and many prophecies and even in the New Testament, he's often referenced. The name of Jesus is only found about 900 times in the Bible. David, there's only, you know, there are more than one person in the Bible named Moses. Did you know that? There's more than one Daniel. There's more than one person called Jesus in the Bible. But there's only one person in the Bible called David. Now, the name David means beloved. And even in his name we understand something about Jesus. By the way, first words in the New Testament, the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David. Last chapter in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, talks about the offspring of David. So you find him not only through the Old Testament, but he starts out the New Testament and ends the New Testament. Very important study to understand the relationship between David and Jesus. He is the beloved. The Bible says God so loved the world, he gave his only beloved son. The very name David means beloved. And you can sing in the Song of Solomon. It talks about that he is the beloved, is mine, and I am his. And Jesus, of course, is that, that uh, metaphor for the bridegroom. And um, from the time of David on through the rest of the kings in the Bible, David becomes the standard for every other king. It'll say this king did not walk in the law of the Lord as David his father. This king did walk in the ways of the Lord as David his father. So David sort of becomes the litmus test for all of the other kings and leaders in the Bible. So David is, um, you first see him appear as this beloved son. He's not only the beloved son, he's the beloved son of an ancient father. You know, God is called the ancient of days. And you can read here, if you look in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and it says in, no, I'm sorry, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel is sent to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. It's kind of interesting that um, he doesn't even know who it is right away. And you read in 1 Samuel 17, in verse 12, now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judea, whose name was Jesse who had eight sons, and the man was an old man advanced in years in the days of Saul. So Jesse is he's an ancient man. David is the beloved son of the ancient of days. We also find out about David. It says that he is a good shepherd. We can see that when Je uh, Samuel comes to anoint one of the sons of Jesse, they don't even invite David because he's taking care of the sheep. Now, those years taking care of the sheep uh, gave him some great perspective on life. He ended up becoming a shepherd of God's people. David is not only a shepherd. The Bible says he's a good shepherd. He's a sacrificial shepherd in that he would lay down his life to save the sheep. There's an account of two stories in the Bible where a bear came to get one of the sheep, and David gets into hand-to-hand -hand combat with a bear and kills it. Now, you might think these Bible stories are a little fantastic. They're mythology. I read in the newspaper in Canada about five years ago about a man that ran into a mother bear in the woods, and the bear attacked him, and he was able to struggle free briefly. He grabbed the limb, a, a limb of a fir tree that had fallen, and it made a perfect baseball bat, and he clobbered the bear over the head, and it dazed the bear, and so he was afraid that it would attack him again. He kept hitting. And then he went to report his injuries to the park rangers. They came and they saw that he had killed a bear with a stick. So don't doubt that a man can kill a bear. And of course, then it says he killed a lion. David was willing to die for his sheep. He was not a hireling. He is the good shepherd. Who is our good shepherd? 
Jesus. And as we go along, you know, the whole point of these studies is for you to see that all of the Old Testament is teaching us about our Savior. And it's not just to be interesting. The attributes of David teach us about the attributes of Jesus. And we want to be like Jesus, right? So he's a good shepherd. He's sacrificial. He's courageous. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus was willing to give his life for us. Then you see that when he's first anointed as king, and he first appears in uh, chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, Samuel comes to Jesse, says, God has told me we're to have a feast, call all your sons. Jesse calls his seven of his sons, but he does not call David because he's the one, he's the least likely to succeed, I guess. And you know, this is something about Jesus. It says he comes up as a root out of dry ground. When Samuel looks at the oldest, Eliab, he looks at the oldest of Jesse's sons, and he's tall, dark, and handsome, and Samuel says within himself, woo, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. This is the one, man, what a majestic, fine-looking young man. He's buff, and he's tall, and he's striking, looks like a natural leader, and God speaks to him and says, don't look on the outside. Man looks on the outside. God looks on the heart. The one the world would have chosen, like Saul, head and shoulders taller than everyone else, or Eliab, God said, no, now I'm going to choose one after my heart. And outwardly, he may not look like his older brothers. And when he finally does show up at the feast, they finally bring him because God tells Samuel, no, this is not the one. This is not the one. He goes through all of Jesse's sons. He says, these are all your boys? He said, oh, well, no, we got a daydreamer. He's a little bit of a poet. And he does play with the sling quite a bit. He's taking care of the sheep. He says, we can't have the feast and sacrifice until you bring him. And as soon as he sees him, God says, this is the one. But it says he was a ruddy, and the word, that means red, and they, they often portray David with red hair. And he's, he's a young man, and they're, they're shocked by his appearance. You know what it says regarding Jesus? There is no outward form or comeliness that we should desire him. Nothing in the Bible. The Bible says that Moses was a pretty baby. The Bible says Joseph was a handsome man. It tells us Rachel was beautiful and Bathsheba, but it never tells us that Jesus was good looking. When they wanted to identify Jesus, they asked Judas, they said, tell us which one he is. We, you know, there's nothing about him. You're going to have to pick him out. He's one of these people from Galilee. A carpenter. And what changed the world about Jesus wasn't the way he looked. It was what he said. Amen? So Samuel doesn't even know who it's going to be, but God says, I'm going to pick someone. John the Baptist is told, the Holy Spirit will tell you who it is that is the Messiah. And finally, he says, this is the Lamb of God. It's at a sacrifice that David is anointed. It's after Jesus is identified as the Lamb of God that he is anointed, baptized, and filled with the Holy Spirit. David begins on the scene of Scripture following his anointing. The ministry of Jesus begins following his anointing, his baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, right about the same time that the Spirit of the Lord comes on David because of the rebellion and the hard-heartedness of Saul, he grieves away the Holy Spirit. And if you grieve away the Holy Spirit, evil spirits can come in. And it says, now Saul is harassed by an evil spirit. So they say, well, maybe if you get a musician who can play some spiritual godly music, it'll drive the devils away. And by the way, friends, don't miss this point. It's a side note, but don't miss this point. If spiritual godly music can drive the devil away, the wrong kind of music can bring the devil in. There are two kinds of music. <laughs> there is good and bad music. So they say, well, I hear that Jesse's got this son, and he's skillful on the harp. And he comes and David plays and the evil spirit is cast out of King Saul. What's one of the first things that Jesus does in his ministry? By the way, that was 1 Samuel 16, 23. You look in Mark 1, 25. Jesus just begins preaching. Chapter 1, one of the first things that happens 
is someone demon-possessed shows up in church. And Jesus rebuked this evil spirit and said, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, it cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. So both Jesus and David are casting out spirits. Jesus is doing it with uh, his word and David with his songs. Then the next thing that happens is you've got this big famous story, the showdown in the valley of Elah between David and Goliath. Again, Jesse's sons, they're all brought to the battle. They're fighting in the war. But uh, Jesse said, David, you better stay and take care of the sheep. But as the battle goes on for 40 days, Goliath is taunting the Israelites. Now, David has been anointed, and now there's a 40-day period. Jesus is anointed, and what happens after he is baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit? Is there another 40-day period? Yeah, he's tempted by the devil in the wilderness. There's a 40-day battle with the giant. And this is what happens in the story of David as well. Now, friends, isn't this interesting, or are they just coincidences? I think the Holy Spirit is telling us that this is uh, inspired. So when he first comes, his brothers say, what are you doing here? With whom did you leave those few sheep? Evidently, they didn't have a lot of sheep never says Jesse was wealthy. They say, we've only got a few sheep. Someone's got to watch them. You left the sheep so you could come see the battle. And while they're talking with David, Goliath comes out and he issues his challenge and he stomps around and he mocks the Lord and the fire and indignation rises up in David's face. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he's mocking the God of Israel? And then David says, what's going to be done for the one that kills the giant? Because in David's mind, he heard the challenge. He thought, if no one's going to fight him, I'll fight him. Oh, he'll, get, he'll marry the king's daughter. And by the way, the church is the bride of Christ, the king's daughter. He'll marry the king's daughter. He'll be tax-free in the kingdom. And uh, David starts to make a skirmish and says, I'll go fight him. And they say, oh, you know, you better get the king's sign off on this. You're kind of a, a young man. Finally, Saul gives permission. David goes off to fight the giant. And well, how does he say he's coming against him? I'm coming against you because I've learned Kung Fu. He says, I'm coming against you because I know Taekwondo, Karate, and Judo. And I'm really fast. Well, well, he said, I've got a spear, and I've got armor, and I've got ballistic missiles. How does he say he's coming against him? In the name of the Lord. So he fights a giant in the wilderness. Do you notice that when he's going to go fight the giant, his brothers say, you need to settle down. His own brothers did not at first support him. What about Jesus? When Jesus began his ministry, look in John chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Can that be any clearer? Eliab said to David, what are you doing here? Go home. Now, it's interesting. I, th I think after David killed Goliath, Eliab said, yep, that's my little brother. But before the battle, so later the brothers of David do join David. You'll find they're with him. They become part of his mighty men. Do Jesus' brothers later also have a change of heart and join him? They do. So lots and lots of parallels between David and uh, between um, Jesus. So what are the weapons that are used? You know, it tells us about all the armor that Goliath has and how much his spear weighs and how much his helmet and his greaves and his armor. And he's a walking tank. And the Bible says Jesus comes, uh, David comes against him and he's got five smooth stones. What is the word of God? Jesus said, he that hears these words of mine, it's like a wise man that's building on what? Rock. What is it that brings down the image in Daniel chapter 2? A rock. What is the word of God? This is the rock that brings down the giant, that crushes the image. This is what we use to fight. What did Jesus use to fight temptation when the devil came in the wilderness? It is written. It is written. It is written. Not only did David use a stone, and I wish I could stop right now and tell you the whole David and Goliath story, but I've done that recently. Um, we know that 
He runs out to meet the giant. He is absolutely fearless. Five stones that he collects from the brook, smooth stones. The word of God is pure. It's smooth. And um, smooth stones also make better ballistics, less wind resistance. But um, it's five is a symbol for the word of God. The books of Moses, the Pentateuch, it's penta is five. It's often represented by five. And so, um, and then he knocks him out with the stone, but he doesn't have a sword. He takes Goliath's sword, which is the biggest and the best in the land. Later, David says, there is none like it. What else is the word of God compared to? The word of God, look in Ephesians chapter 6. The word of God is the sword of the spirit is the word of God. You look in Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Revelation, Jesus is portrayed coming with a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Double-edged meaning the law and the prophets, the new and the old testament. And David uses a sword and he decapitates. The giant's not getting back up. And it's amazing when David kills Goliath with the stone and the sword, these are symbols for the word of God. How do we fight the devil? This is the way Jesus did it. It is written, it is written. You know, we need to memorize the word of God. Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. I guess if I was to ask people and they were to be honest, you could tell me who the latest stars are on The Bachelor, or you could tell me, <laughs> only Bachelor program you're supposed to be watching is the Doug Bachelor program. <laughs> the, or you could tell them, you know, who has the American Idol or who is the voice, or it's amazing to me. Sometimes I see, I see Jeopardy, and they start asking about all these TV programs, and I don't know any of the answers. But everybody knows the answers and who these stars are, their private lives, and what their baby's name is, and I'm going, and you wonder how many Christians are watching those things too. We can't quote scripture, but we can quote Hollywood. We need to hide God's word in our heart, amen? This is how David, Bible tells us, God has given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature. It is through the word of God. We're transformed, we're convicted of sin. So David defeats the giant with the word. We're to put on the armor of God. Something else in the story of David and Goliath that I think is a great illustration. The whole challenge of Goliath is based upon a unique war. Goliath comes down and says, instead of all the Philistines fighting all the Israelites, I will be the representative for all of them. You pick your representative. We too will battle. We don't have to kill and all the soldiers and, and destroy the country. Whoever wins this battle, the losers become the servants. They pay taxes to the winners. Our nation will occupy your nation. We'll be the ones in control. So Goliath goes to represent the Philistines. Who goes to represent God's people? God's people. David is the mediator. He is the one that goes out to represent the nation. You listening, friends? The victory of David becomes the victory of the nation. Was Jesus victorious? Do we get to embrace his victory? And you know what I think is so funny? I, I can't wait to watch this video when I get to heaven of what happened that day. Uh, hopefully there'll be translation available. But uh, I am sure when David marched out to fight the giant, the soldiers in the Israel army were saying, I'm giving you 50 to 1 on Goliath. 50 to 1 on Goliath. Any takers? No, I'm not taking that. He might have had one or two people who said, oh, I might make some money. Yeah, I'll go, on the, I'll go on the one that doesn't look like he's going to win. I heard this year at the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby, the horse they guessed would place last won the race. Any of you hear that? Happens every now and then, doesn't it? But after David won, all of these soldiers that thought he didn't have a chance were shouting hurrah, and they followed David against the Philistines. His victory became their victory. Friends, did Jesus win against the devil? Can we be victorious because of his victory? Absolutely. It's a great example. And the Bible tells us that uh, he killed the Philistine and brought his armor to his tent. Jesus tells a story. He says, if you kill a strong man, Luke chapter 11, you overcome him, you take all his armor that he trusted in. He uses the same language. Something else about David is 
David later has to flee from Saul and he's looking for food and the only food he can find is the bread in the temple which is called holy bread. David eats the holy bread. Is, what does bread represent? Little clue? The Bible, right? Man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word. What kind of word does Jesus speak? Holy bread. Jesus, the son of David. And you know, that's another clue, is even the Jewish people, they knew the Messiah was going to be called the son of David. They knew that he would be something like David because so often they said, son of David, Hosanna to the son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. Whenever anyone used the phrase son of David to talk to Jesus, that person believed Jesus was the Messiah, that he was going to be the new king of Israel that would save them. So David, he eats holy bread. Then you find that um, because David then, he becomes the armor bearer after he defeats Goliath for, for uh, King Saul. But one day Saul and David are coming back from battle. David had fought many battles by himself at this point. And the women of the city come out and they begin to sing and they, they've got a little bit of envy. And they come out and they sing, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. Saul, who's the king, Here's this young whippersnapper getting more adulation and praise than him. And instead of saying, good for you, David, you deserve it, he becomes threatened and jealous. And he wants to now kill and destroy David. His own people want to kill him because of jealousy. Did that happen to Jesus? You know what it says here? Pilate says in Matthew 27, 18, for he knew it was out of envy they had delivered him up. Because the people were listening to Jesus and following Jesus and the multitudes came and they sang his praises, the religious leaders wanted to kill him. Jealousy and envy is what did it. Then David now has to run from Saul. And David basically becomes a champion in exile. He can't go into the main cities. He has to live kind of out in the wild places. The ministry of Jesus, he had to avoid Jerusalem. Jesus said, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. The foxes have their holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but I've got nowhere to lay my head. David was living in caves and in strongholds of the mountains because he was running like a hunted animal. And Jesus often had to teach outside. He was not allowed in many of the synagogues. And so these are like living uh, in uh, like exiles. Something else about David and Jesus I think is interesting is as David is living out in the wilds like this, he begins to attract his followers. You can read about this where it says in 1 Samuel 22, verse 2, And everyone who was in distress, and everybody who was in debt, and everybody who was discontented gathered to him. Now, how many of you would like to gather a church and say, we're going to put out an ad and say, all of you who are distressed, discontented, and in debt, come follow me. I would not want to be a leader of people that are all discontented, distressed, and in debt. But he ends up gathering together what you would think would be the off-scouring of society. And from these rebels, this motley crew, he turns into his mighty men. Now what did Jesus do? Did Jesus, when he wanted to build a new church, did he go to the seminaries of Jerusalem? Or does he get cursing fishermen and shepherds and some of the people you would think would be the most least likely to succeed? David becomes a captain over them like Robin Hood, so to speak, living out there in the wilds and living off the, the good of, uh, of some of the people that cared for him. Paul says regarding the church, 1 Corinthians 1.26 for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame those things that are mighty. So here, David and Jesus, they turn the world upside down by taking what you would think would be the ragtag people, those apostles, tax collectors, and fishermen, and shepherds, they end up becoming the most profound writers, teachers, speakers, and they turn the world upside down. David takes his mighty men 
and he develops an army that never loses a battle. Isn't that something? When you think about it. I'm going to have to hasten along. David is a just king and a merciful king. What about our Savior? Is our Savior a merciful king and a merciful judge? Was David a judge? Did he sit to judge the people as well? Jesus was a judge. He's a merciful judge, as David was. And I could think of many examples I could cite where David showed this mercy. Did uh, the enemies of David want to pierce him with a spear? Did King Saul throw a spear at David? Yeah. 1 Samuel 19.10, Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear. What about Jesus? John 19.34, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. What was the central passion in David's heart? David had zeal for God's house. David had a passion for God's house. After he was finally settled in the kingdom, by the way, Jesus begins his ministry. How old is he when he's baptized? 30 years of age. How old is David when he, Saul finally commits suicide? He dies in battle. And uh, David becomes king. He's 30. Jesus is baptized at 30. Isn't that interesting? A lot of these coincidences. Or are they coincidences? David cared for his family when he was being hunted by the enemy. He sent his mother and father to live with the king of Moab because who was the grandmother of David? Ruth. Isn't that right? And so Ruth was a Moabitess. And so David had some friends there. So he cared for his family. Jesus is hanging in the, on the cross. Does Jesus care about his mother while he's hanging on the cross? He shows that they, he honors his father and his mother. They nearly stoned Jesus on more than one occasion. They took, and you can look in John 8, verse 59. Look in John 10, verse 31. What about David? Nearly stoned by his own people. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. Now great, David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Isn't that interesting? Was Jesus merciful to his enemies? Did he say, love your enemies? What about David? Was David merciful? Several times Saul wanted to kill him. David had an opportunity to get even and kill Saul. And he told his soldiers, don't touch him. He says, let the Lord take care of it. Vengeance is the Lord's. And he said, um, God will deal with it. Shimei comes out to curse David. Abishai says, let me go kill him. David said, let him curse. I probably deserve it. His own son rebels against him, and he says, be merciful with Absalom. David is very merciful, very forgiving. He's even kind to his enemies, but there, you could reach a point where he, David could also show great wrath. He could show great mercy. He sent some of his messengers to show uh, mercy to this, uh, the son or the prince of the Ammonites, and they mistreated the messengers of David, David went to war with that kingdom and wiped them out because of the way he, they treated his messengers. Uh, another type or analogy that you would find in there. When the, the apostles wanted to call fire down from heaven on the Samaritans, Jesus turned and he rebuked them. And if the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them, you don't know what spirit you're of. You know, David was a winner. You want to go to battle? Go with David. He won every battle. Jesus won, wins every battle with the devil. He doesn't lose. You want to be on his side. Something else you'll see is David experiences great betrayal. His own son rebels against him. Absalom wants to have him killed. The chief counselor of David was someone by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel betrayed David in Jerusalem, he was one of his close friends. The betrayal backfires, and Ahithophel commits suicide. Judas betrays Jesus in Jerusalem. The betrayal backfires. Judas commits suicide. Interesting. And, of course, the betrayal of his own son. And then during this tremendous battle between the forces of David 
and the forces that followed Absalom. It's just like the story of Jesus. You know, Jesus created all things. Yes, Jesus even made a beautiful angel named Lucifer. And Lucifer, unprovoked, rebels against his creator, his king, and wants to destroy him. Absalom was beautiful. Lucifer, beautiful. Absalom, talented, powerful. Lucifer, talented, powerful. Rebels against his maker. Rebels against his father. You see the scenario here? And the Bible says in that final great battle, there's a great battle. Will David's been exiled from his kingdom, but he's coming to get his kingdom back. Is Jesus coming to get his world back? In that great battle, he says, show mercy to the young man, to Absalom. He, he shows love for this son who wants to kill him. He's an enemy. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Even when we live in rebellion, even when we follow the devil, the Lord loves us and he's wanting to win us back. And when Absalom finally dies, and this is a place where the typology and the analogy crosses over a little bit, Absalom, the son of David, dies hanging in a tree and he's pierced. He's a type of Christ who dies hanging in a tree who becomes sin for us. And then David prays a prayer of a broken heart. He says, oh Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, my son, would God I had died for thee, oh Absalom, my son. And this is what the Lord is saying. I love you so much, I want to die for you. I so love you, I sent my son to die for you. In the story of David, you've got the gospel. One of the final scenes you see in David, David numbers Israel, trying to see how big the kingdom is. And God says, you shouldn't have been trusting in your army. And so a plague comes on the country. And thousands are dying in the plague. And this angel is coming through the heavens with a sword. And the angel is above Jerusalem with a drawn sword, ready to send the plague and the destruction on Jerusalem. David goes to intercede for the people and he says, Lord, let the judgment be on me and my house. I will take it. But what have these sheep done? Take me, not the sheep. He puts himself in between God and says, I will take your wrath. And David offers sacrifice there. He offers sacrifice on the very place where Abraham offered Isaac, the very place where the temple was later built and the Dome of the Rock is today. It's called the threshing floor of Ornan. But there David intercedes. He's a great intercessor. And the hand of judgment is withdrawn because of the mediation and the intercess, intercession of David. David offers himself for the nation. So when you read in the Bible these stories in the Old Testament, they're really telling us the story of, of uh, Jesus. Can you see that, friends? Now, I've truncated it. As I said, David's name is mentioned a thousand, more than a thousand times in the Bible. You study the life of David there in the Old Testament, you're going to get glimpses. You're going to see sightings of Jesus in the gospel in there, and you'll learn more about his character and the plan of salvation. You'll understand something about the mercy of God, the patience of God, the, the music. I mean, look at the Psalms of David. You could Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David wrote that. Jesus quotes it from the cross. Later in the Psalm, it says, they cast lots for my clothing. They pierced my hands and my feet. These messianic psalms written by David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It tells us so much about Jesus. So in studying the life of David, I think you'll become better acquainted with your Savior. Amen? Most importantly, David liberated the nation from all their enemies. David was not only the king of Israel, he became the king of the other kings. He became a king of kings. Jesus is our king of kings. Amen? And David conquers all the nations around him. Our king, Jesus, is going to conquer. Amen? I think that's a beautiful segue into what will be our closing song. I'd like to invite the choir and the orchestra to come up. They're probably staging back there now. And uh, we're going to be singing that beautiful song, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And on the final two verses, you are invited to stand, and I'll be standing down there with you, and sing in the chorus.